Let's explore the Linux boot process. This presentation aims to provide a comprehensive understanding of the sequence of events that occur from the moment you power on your machine until you are presented with a login prompt. The boot process comprises of four key stages. Stage one is the BIOS or UEFI, during which a power on self-test is performed and the hardware is initialized. Stage two involves the bootloader, such as GRUB, which loads the kernel and the initial RAM disk. In stage three, the kernel takes over, initializing the hardware and mounting the root file system. Finally, stage four is the init system like SysDamd or Sysvanite, which starts all the necessary system services. Stage one is the basic input or output system, also known as BIOS or UEFI, which stands for Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. The BIOS is the first program that runs when your computer is powered on. It performs a power on self-test, also known as POST, to ensure all hardware components are functioning correctly. The BIOS initializes essential hardware components such as the CPU, memory, and storage devices. It identifies bootable devices according to a pre-configured boot order, and finally, it loads and executes the bootloader from either the master boot record, also known as MBR, or the GUID partition table, also known as GPT. Here's a comparison between the traditional BIOS and the modern UEFI. When comparing the features, we find that BIOS has slower boot times, while UEFI offers faster boot times. BIOS is limited to disks of 2 terabytes or less, while UEFI supports disks larger than 2 terabytes. BIOS operates in 16-bit mode, while UEFI operates in 32 or 64-bit mode. BIOS uses the MBR partition style, while UEFI uses the GPT partition style. Finally, BIOS provides basic security, while UEFI provides secure boot functionality. UEFI stands for Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, which is a modern replacement for the traditional BIOS. It provides a mini operating system between the firmware and the operating system. It supports secure boot to prevent unauthorized code execution. It uses the GPT GWT partition table instead of MBR. It stores boot information in the EFI system partition, also known as ESP, and it offers a graphical interface with mouse support. Stage two is the bootloader, and a common bootloader in Linux is GRUB, which stands for Grand Unified Bootloader. The bootloader is loaded by the BIOS or UEFI from the master boot record or the EFI system partition. It presents a boot menu, giving you options for different operating systems or kernel versions to boot. The bootloader loads the Linux kernel into memory and passes kernel parameters, which are settings that configure how the kernel operates. Finally, it loads the initial RAM disk, which may be referred to as initured or initramps. The grub configuration file is typically located at slash boot slash grub slash grub cfg. Common grub kernel parameters include quiet splash and virtual terminal, handoff equals seven. The grub boot menu allows you to select an operating system to boot. You can use the arrow keys to select an entry and press enter to boot the selected operating system. You can press E to edit the commands before booting or press C for a command line interface. The grub process flow involves three stages. First, the master boot record or GPT loads the grub core. Next, the file system drivers are loaded and finally, the full GRUB environment with the menu is presented. Stage three involves the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel is the core of the operating system. It decompresses itself into memory and initializes the CPU, memory, and other devices. The kernel mounts the root file system, which is the base directory structure of the operating system. Finally, it executes the first user space process, which is commonly referred to as init. To view kernel messages during boot, you can use the command D message. To check the current kernel version, use the command you name space r. The Linux kernel comprises various components, including file systems, device drivers, memory management, and a process scheduler. During the boot process, grub loads the kernel, which in turn starts the init process. 
The kernel is responsible for managing the system's resources and providing essential services. Next up is the initial RAM disk, commonly referred to as Initramps or Initrd. The initial RAM disk is a temporary root file system loaded into memory. It contains essential drivers and modules needed to prepare the system to mount the real root file system. It handles complex storage setups such as RAID, logical volume management, and encryption. Finally, it executes early user space scripts. To view the contents of any tramps, you can create a directory, change into it, and then use the command zcat slash boot slash image dash, you name space dash r, pipe pio dash idmv. The kernel loads any tramps into memory and executes the slash init script as process identification one. It loads the necessary drivers and modules, mounts the real root file system, and then performs a switch underscore root to the real root file system. Stage 4 is the init system. The init system is the first process with process identification one started by the kernel after mounting the root file system. It is responsible for starting all other system processes, managing system services and daemons, handling orphan processes, and remains running until system shutdown. To check your init system, you can use the command ps space p space 1. Common init systems include systemd, sysvanit, Upstart, OpenRC, and Runit. SystemD is used in distributions like Ubuntu, Fedora, Debian, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and CentOS, and it offers features like parallel service startup and dependency management. Sysvanid is used in older Linux distributions and uses sequential run levels with shell scripts. Upstart was used in older Ubuntu versions and is event based and job oriented. OpenRC is used in Gentoo and Alpine, is dependency-based and compatible with Sysvanit scripts. Runit is used in Void Linux and is simple, reliable, and provides service supervision. SystemD is a modern init system with features like parallel service startup for faster boot times, socket and dbus activation, service dependency management, on-demand starting of daemons, and system state tracking with targets. Common systemd commands include system control status followed by the service name, system control list dash units dash dash type equals service, and journal control dash u followed by the service name dot service. Systemd includes components like journal d, udev d, login d, network d, resolved, and time sync d. It utilizes target levels such as sysinit.target, basic.target, multiuser.target, graphical.target, and default.target. Let's summarize the boot process and discuss troubleshooting. To troubleshoot boot issues, check the BIOS or UEFI settings in boot order. Use GRUB recovery mode or single user mode. Examine kernel logs with D message. Review the system D journal with journal control. Check file system integrity with FSCK. To analyze boot time, use systemd analyze. And to check service startup times, Use systemd analyze blame. The complete boot process flow involves these stages BIOS or UEFI, then GRUB, then the kernel, then any tramps, and finally systemd. Here are some key takeaways. The Linux boot process follows a logical sequence. Each stage has specific responsibilities. Understanding the boot process helps with troubleshooting. Modern systems use UEFI, GPT, and systemd and the boot process can be customized and optimized. If you like this video, hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe. Visit codelucky.com for more such useful content.